episode 113 of the Inside the Mind podcast. And I'm super pumped to be joined by Daria Beattie, who is a 2018 Olympian, a cross-country skier as part of Team Canada. And I guess one of the the few people in the world that loves the winter, at least from my perspective, a lot of people that I live with really hate winter, but I know the nature of your sport. And I think I've read it through kind of some of your blog posts, just how much love there is for winter. Was that something you think naturally uh, kind of you were born with? I know you're from from the northwest of Canada. Yeah, I'm from I'm from the Yukon Territory. So I grew up in a place where there's six months plus of winter. And I think uh, you either learn to love it or move away <laughs> as soon as possible. And I definitely learned to love it. Uh, there's there's so many uh, amazing opportunities in the Yukon in the winter to do outdoor activities, which really helps. So yeah, I'm definitely a fan of the winter. I often overheat in the summer. And so I think if I could only have one season, I probably would, would choose winter, honestly. Got you. Got you. One of the, um, the unique things I think about kind of your athletic journey to date is your blog that you run. I know on your website, is it dariabd.com for those that want to it check is. it out? Perfect. Yes. So yes. I'll put, a, I'll put a link in that for people in the description, but just reading through your blog and I, I went back through some of your posts previously and just I mean, A, just the amount of adversity they're able to open up about and just kind of putting yourself out there. Because I think for a lot of people, they have these aspirations to write a blog, write a story, whatever it is about themselves to share their experiences with other, I guess, is, is what it all comes down to. But they're scared of putting themselves out there, you know, worrying about what other people think. So I guess the first question is, when did you start... And when, uh, yeah, when did you start the blog and kind of start sharing those experiences on your website? I started the blog, um, well, nine years ago now when I moved away from home uh, after graduating high school down to Canmore, Alberta to train here with the Alberta World Cup Academy and the National Ski Team Program. And I thought it was a good time to to start start a blog, no longer being being in Whitehorse, being in the Yukon and having so many amazing supporters from that community. I started it more as a way for them to be able to follow along on my journey and I've continued it since then. And it's been cool seeing viewership uh, grow to other parts of the world as well and and reading along. And uh, it's definitely easier to write about the good times, but I've tried hard to to include uh, the struggles and the obstacles that I've also had to overcome because it's, it's, I think it's important for, for people to, to be able to share in the good and the bad with you. And I mean, I think in the last five years, I don't know, arbitrarily choose five years as a time frame. people are more and more open to sharing those moments of adversity online, but you doing it already kind of nine years ago, I think a little bit ahead of the curve, just in terms of it's very contrary to what I think the perception is of people, you know, what they think they have to put on social media. It's always, they have to put out their best picture of themselves, the best video of themselves, whatever it is to show off, you know, this impression of who they are as a person kind of hiding all the the adversity and all the bad things that go on. And I had this discussion with another podcast too, at one point, and, and we were talking about, I think just that authentic piece, like you're like you're describing here, the authenticity of you know showing the good and the bad is really what is the true desire. I think of consumers of media is is feeling that connection and that, that authenticity. And the more emotional stories you're able to relate to, I think just the more success to whatever media it is. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Uh, it, it's nice to to share the good times and the excitement, and it's easy to write about that and. Uh, it's usually well, honestly what you have the most content about throwing it out there on your, your Instagram, your Facebook pages and stuff like that. But I've always thought of my blog more as a, as a full story. And so taking the time to, to put in the lessons I've learned and everything, cause it, life is a growing process. And if I can share, share those, um, times of growth with others, maybe it'll help them grow without having to make the same mistakes or go through the same obstacles as well. So I've always thought of my blog a bit more um, as a place where I'm not just highlighting my life. It's more uh, more of the content. 
and teaching, I assume as well, like teaching others about, about these lessons, right. And, and how to get through moments of adversity that they can relate to. Um, and there's obviously levels to adversity. There's adversity that's easy to get past to easier, I guess, and adversity that's harder to get past to. Have you ever encountered a moment of adversity where perhaps, um, related to your athletic career that you maybe hesitated on sharing in part of like that blog or your website or just social media in general? For sure. There's been, I mean, there's been areas where, uh, I've taken a bit of time before sharing. It's, it's definitely hard to, to share right away when you're in, in the moment of adversity as well. Um, there's also struggles that I've shared less openly on my blog, but have made the effort to share with teammates and, uh, younger athletes that I've mentored and, and, uh, kind of helped. And so it's definitely, it's a hard balance because you want to be able to share your experiences and give advice and hopefully help people, uh, through what they're going through as well, or just, uh, give inspiration for other people to, to try something. But at the same time, it, it does make you more vulnerable. And, uh, so yeah, yeah, I definitely, it's, uh, sometimes hard to know when the right time to, to fully open up is. And you have to, I find I have to be totally kind of okay with where I'm at myself and whatever that adversity is before I can kind of put it on, uh, out for others to hear. So it is definitely a process. It's, I wouldn't say it's easy to just, you know, (laughs) write about everything that goes wrong. So sometimes I don't share things right away or I, uh, even, hesitate about whether or not I should, um, yeah, share, share the ups and downs at all and just kind of stick with the ups. But then usually at the end of the day, I think it's important to, to add those in there, even if you're not going into, to full detail about whether, you know, it was an injury in the season struggling with that was really hard to deal with or whatnot. But I think, um, even, even just uh, acknowledging those things, uh, is important to, to, yeah to, um, give that information to your, to your supporters, because one of the biggest things I learned from an early age was that I'm my own harshest critic when it comes to sport and it comes to achievements. Um, so most of the time, the people that are following my blog and supporting me, they're just really proud of everything I've done and worked towards. So they're happy to support in the more difficult times as well. They're not going to say, well, why weren't you perfect here? (laughs) So that's uh, a good thing to remind yourself of, I think for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, so I, so I wrote down so many notes from that because I think you, you just relayed a lot of beautiful lessons there, but the, the two that really stick out, the one that I'll start with is when well, you mentioned that you were your, your own critic, your hardest critic is yourself type of thing. And I've had a lot of athletes share that same thing. And I guess it's made me clue in over the months and years I've talked to to athletes like yourself is that's probably a very necessary trait to be a successful athlete or successful in whatever area of life it is, athletics or not, personal, relationship, professional, because you need that sense of inner motivation. Because I think that, that, that piece of being a critic comes from like that inner motivation of wanting to be the best you can be. And if you're relying on others to push you there, you of course need others as a support system in some way or another, but you don't want them to be the main driver of your motivation. You want it to be yourself. I totally agree with that. I think it's very rare that you're going to be truly successful in something unless that uh, motivation is intrinsic. And so it's a very, very common trait, I think in athletes, but also in humans as people, we, we naturally, you know, pick out all our flaws and everything we've done wrong and where we can do better next time. And that's what allows us to grow. But then you have to find that balance of acknowledging all the points that can be improved upon without punishing yourself for those points. So for me, it was, you know, acknowledging that I want to continue growing here and maybe I didn't achieve what I was hoping to, and then saying, okay, well, how can I what can I change? What can I do moving forward to try to achieve these goals or my next goal better the next time, but also take the moment to be, uh, to realize what I did do well. And that by not achieving those, I'm not a lesser person. And so I can continue to try to strive for those goals and, and be aware that I set a lot of high goals for myself and most of them probably never will 
be achieved quite to the the vision I had in my head initially, but it'll uh, bring me along a pretty incredible path along the way. And I definitely will check off some of those goals uh, along the way if I keep uh, striving for them and reevaluating and readjusting as I go. I think that was a really good piece you brought up there was like acknowledging these sort of moments of adversity or, or whatever it is without punishing yourself. Because it's very easy, I think, or very natural for people to look at a goal they set and you know punish themselves. There's like it's it's very easy to do them both at the same time to acknowledge something and punish it yourself at the same time. I guess it's all about looking at it without regret. For me personally, um, how I I've tried to get around that that conundrum is I just look at it as if I gave my best effort, no matter the result, as long as I have my effort and I'm pleased with that. Of course, the result isn't going to be there 100% of the time, but I can control my effort. And as long as my effort is 100%, I feel like it's given me a real a real leg up on how to acknowledge things that go on without punishing myself for them at the same time. Yeah, that's uh, very true. And I think that's a great advice to try to live by what you just said there. Um, I had the opportunity to start working with a sports psychologist at quite a young age, a uh, mental performance coach um, with my ski team. And we used it as it wasn't a tool. It was a tool that everyone used just to grow and learn to become a better athlete. It wasn't, you have a problem. So now you use a sports psychologist, which I think a lot of the times was the refrain uh, in our team. It was, everyone's going to work with a sports psychologist and we're going to learn how to better train our mental side of the sport, because that's just as important as the physical. And it's a training tool. It's not a, a solution to a problem. And I feel really grateful for having that opportunity to uh, work with a uh, sports psychologist from the age of 14 and really kind of learn those basics as a teenager, as I was kind of growing into deciding if skiing was something I wanted to pursue full time. And it, I feel really lucky to kind of had a good handle on that uh, at that age. Are there one or two kind of tricks or strategies or kind of in the moment exercises that that you've taken away from your work with a sports psychologist that as you think back, you know, may have the most impact on your athletic career and your performance? Yeah. Well, one of them is a really simple thing. It's, it's not even really a a specific to it. Well, it's a tool for sure. But for me, I, I had a hard time not thinking about upcoming events. I was very focused on, the trials event that was coming up or the big race and that sort of thing. And so I would start playing these events over in my head months ahead of time, but then it would get more and more specific as I got closer. And one of the best tools I figured out how to use was just consciously creating distractions for myself, going into big events, going into weekends, knowing that I needed a plan on fun things to do with teammates the night before, whether it's playing cards or those sort of things, or, you know, a movie to watch and creating that and planning that into my schedule. So I wasn't inside my own head. And that's a really easy thing to do if you're, you're aware of it. But a lot of the time, if you're just acting passively, then those thoughts are able to, to come into your head and kind of take over the focus and you start thinking about the results and less about the process. So I really created a strategy where I was keeping myself busy, I was keeping myself entertained. And then I had the period of time when I was doing my training the day before the race or writing my race plan the night out where I was fully focused on what the race was going to be. But outside of those times, I wasn't allowed to think about it and allowed me to kind of concentrate on the task at hand and what I could actually control without completely overthinking things and spinning it into something way bigger and more stressful than just another race because all races are just races at the end of the day they just have a different level of importance uh maybe scaled to them on the world stage but at the same time you're doing you're doing the same thing every time when you uh you strap on your skis so exactly that's that's such a such a, a practical and effective strategy are the the conscious distractions and I think especially too for athletes out there that are looking to implement that as kind of rationale of why they should do it. When you think about an athlete, they train most, if not their whole life in their sport. And, you know, you look going up to a race and it's like, 
you need to learn to trust all the work you've put in year after year after year. And like, how much are you really going to improve by stressing over or constantly thinking about whatever race or event is coming up? I like to um, compare this conscious distraction to analogy to like what I used to do. I didn't realize I was doing this in university, but I ended up doing a university. Whenever I would take an exam, I would never study like 24 hours before the exam. And I would just play video games. And I don't know if back then my intent was conscious distraction <laughs> or I just didn't want to study. But thinking back, part of it, I think what I did is because I didn't want to cram some of the material that I was trying to learn. And it's like when you start cramming things or perhaps if for an athletic event, when you start thinking about it closer and closer to, it just naturally creates that sense of urgency and anxiety. Um, that obviously in some ways can be good for an athlete to, you know, if they're naturally maybe more of a mellow person and they need to get amped up for a race. But I think in majority of cases, when you have those heightened senses of anxiety, it's going to um, go in the opposite direction for athletic performance. So that's how kind of takeaway I took away from that is it helped me back then for university when I was writing exams, not to just get too stressed about it and just remember, you know, I've spent six, eight months studying for it one night isn't I'm not going to cram anything that's useful in one night. Let me just turn my brain off, relax and write the exam when it comes. Yeah, no, yeah, very true and give yourself that uh, mental reprieve before for the uh stressful event and uh I think what you're saying too about uh the anxiety levels is that something something I've played around with too and when and learned about is just knowing what your activation level is and if you're a person that when when stress does come on, you're, you, you're kind of more chill or less chill and where your ideal level is to be able to feel like you're in a good space to, to push your body and compete and go out and, and do what you know how to do instead of trying to do something that is more than what you're capable of. Cause I think it's very easy to think that you have to do something more in order to excel when you're competing. Whereas really the whole reason you've been training is so that you can go out and do what you can do. And that hope that will be good enough if you put in the right training and, you know, you put everything out there, but you're not trying to pull something out of your hat. You're going out and, and doing what you've rehearsed essentially, just like, like you said, but studying is like what you're going to cram in the last two hours isn't going to add. It's going to be all the knowledge you've uh, registered and learned through the course and that you're going to be able to put that into practice and you don't need to pull out something extra to be able to, 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 uh, succeed. So kind of knowing for you, if it means if cramming makes you feel more prepared, then maybe it's a good option. And that activates you up. Like you're saying, if having that 24 hours before brings you to the level of confidence, it's like, it's finding that balance. Then for everyone, it's different, which is kind of cool what works for the person beside you is going to be totally different than what works for you. And so you can't look to other people to see if you're doing it right. in uh, in preparation, I love how you brought up like different activation levels work for different people, because like how you said there for me, myself cramming before an exam didn't work, but for somebody else, even though they might not necessarily, for example, say it's science in that two hours before the exam, they might not learn anything useful yeah. for the exam, but just that peace of mind to know yeah. that, like if this is just what helps them calm down or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. I'm curious for yourself because you mentioned that like that you had to figure out what your activation level was for the most of your success um, as an athlete. I'm curious kind of what what that process looks like to figure out your activation, your optimal activation level. Is it kind of a running diary of events and writing down, you know, one, two, and three? Is it just more so reflecting back perhaps by yourself or with a sports psychologist or mental coach? What does, what does that process, I guess, look like? Yeah, for me, it looked a lot of like a lot initially of reflecting back on races that had gone well, races that hadn't gone well, trying to establish how I felt before them, what my stress levels were like. And then uh, when I was that season where I was kind of focusing more on trying to figure out what worked for me was being not necessarily changing what I was doing going into events, but being more conscious of how I was feeling in that moment, what, what did it, uh, result in results wise, but also like, how did I feel energy and confidence wise in the race, regardless of the actual number result? 
How did I feel like I executed my plan? Was I focused mentally throughout throughout the race in the in the zone, really give it, leaving everything out there, or was I distracted? Um, because it's easy to say, oh, I won this race, I came last in this race, and just solely, you know, use that as an indicator. But a lot of times, you know, there's very varying levels of competition. You can't control what other people are doing on any given day. So I found that it was important to to for me to find the races where I felt like I was the most focused on my um on my technique and um goals process driven goals instead of the result and find where I was most happy with executing those process driven goals and that kind of led me to figure out what I needed for activation level and then that uh from there could find hopefully better results uh over time because I was able to cue into the actually fully executing the process each time it's reflection it's it it's it's so effective but yet so simple at the same time i feel like like it, it may it may kind of seem like this burdensome task but when you get into the, like just actually doing it it's such a simple but effective strategy and you had mentioned that i believe when we were first talking about uh when you were working with a sports psychologist that the the best tip he gave you was such a simple tip and it made me think about just how much of our success are just down to just the simplest tips i think it's in my um experience talking with different athletes and just my own personal life, knowing people and whatnot. It's like, I think there, there's sometimes a, a, a natural tendency for a person when they get farther along in their field or farther along in their sport, um, that they start to make things more complex because naturally yeah. they need to find that those ways to get like 1% better, get the 1% leg up on their competition. But then on the flip side, how many times do you hear in the media, you know, when an athlete is struggling, they say they just went back to the basics and just worked yeah. on the basics. It's so funny because it's like they spend <laughs> all this time trying to find the complex things. And then at the end of the day, they just need to do the things that are the basics, the foundation. In my experience, that's so spot on. I mean, the ba- going back to the basics and having a really strong foundation, whether it's from the mental performance side, the technical side of your of sport or uh, the physiological side. A lot of the times when there's uncertainty it's just so important to bring yourself back to the basics, make sure those underlying pillars are strong. And then of course, when you're trying, like you said, you're trying to get that extra 0.1% or those small details, those small margins and every, if everything is going well at the basics, then you start kind of playing around with those things, trying to figure out, you know, what's going to make that half second of a difference that could, could uh, be the difference between, uh, winning and coming second or even winning and coming 10th and those sort of things. But at the end of the day, that portion is so small and we spend so much time in life just mastering the basics and building on those. And if that, if that, that bottom isn't, isn't strong and you don't come back to it and remind yourself of that, you start losing it. And it's hard to put the small details on top if the, if the foundation isn't sturdy. So uh, it's the start of our training season right now. We start up training every May. We take April off because our race season ends in at the end of March. And, and mentally and physically right now, that's what we're doing. We're going back, back to the basics. We're doing an on-snow training camp right now. And with ski technique, that's what we're doing. Re- reminding ourselves of the basics, skiing without our poles on, focusing on the technique that then we can build on for the rest of the year. Just keeping things simple and reminding ourselves of the things that we've told others and been told millions of times, but we still have to kind of reiterate those reminders uh, at the start of each year so that we don't forget about them. Uh, yeah. And I think it's not only like basics, working on the basics is not only helpful, you know, just in general, but especially helpful when you start to take some time off of a sport. Like you said, you were just kind of in a bit of an off season. And I related to my my own experience with tennis. Obviously, we talked about a bit before about the lockdown in Ontario. And so my tennis yeah. has been off and on for <laughs> like the past two years. And every yeah. time there's a lockdown and I come back, part of me, there's this tendency to like work on where I left off whatever drills or lessons I was on, I wanted to start there. But then in the back of my mind, I know I need to start with the basics. And I start with the basics and I'm actually like, I surprised myself just um, 
how much, you know, in, in how much, in how, in what short amount of time I can get back to level where I was at. And sometimes even past to where I was at before uh, the break happened or the lockdown happened. So I think for a lot of people out there, um, I'd, I'd want to stress to them that the basics are of course good to work on all throughout your life. But especially whenever you have to take some time off, use those basics as a springboard to get yourself comfortable back to whatever you were doing. Exactly. It's the best starting place. It's uh, what you're what you know most and probably where you're most comfortable. And then you can really you can really grow from there in any direction. And to... there's nothing bad about it either. Right. Like, there's nothing to be ashamed about going back to the simplest thing for and then rebuilding up. Exactly. Exactly. Because when you look at sports and all the athletes that we see on TV, Olympic Games, NHL, NFL, whatever it is, it may look so flashy and everything, everything they're doing. But when you really analyze it, they really are just doing the basics. Like there's nothing quote unquote like flashy about it. They're just doing the basics. They're just doing the basics really, really, really good because they've practiced it a million times in their life. Yeah. Yeah. The one thing that I wanted to go back to for a second, um, towards the beginning part of our interview was you talked about moving away from home just after high school for sports, uh, for cross country skiing. And I mean, I think a lot of people have a hard time moving away from home when they're 35. I couldn't imagine just how much harder it could be just fresh out of high school. So I'm just curious if you could just don't mind taking a couple minutes to walking through your thought process during that time, how hard of a decision that was to make if there was a bit of back and forth to it, or if it really was in the grand scheme of things, being confident in yourself as an athlete, knowing the steps it takes to get to where you are. And perhaps it might have been maybe an easier decision than I'm leading it on to be. Yeah. Well, so the decision itself actually was extremely easy. Um, It was more, I'd say within the first year of moving away from home that it was more difficult. And the, the adjustment period to that, I was super excited to I'd grown up and lived in Whitehorse my whole life. And uh, I, I love Whitehorse and I'll probably move back there one day and uh, hopefully raise the family there. But at the same time, it is a small town and in Northern Canada. And I was pretty excited to, to start a, a new chapter and the national ski team is based out of Canmore. So that is where I moved to. And I was really excited about training with a group of 12 other women that were at a very elite level and having the chance to learn and grow from them. So the decision itself, I was pretty excited about. I had organized to live with a a billet family the first year. And so that definitely eased the transition because I wasn't just completely on my own. I still had that, that family atmosphere around me, which in hindsight really, really helped the transition because that, that, that first season, didn't actually go as planned at all for me. I had a really good first month of the year, qualified for my first ever World Cup race that was being held here in Canada, I competed at that. It was very exciting. My family and friends all came to watch. It was here in Canmore, Alberta. And then I just, my, I kind of fell off a cliff performance wise uh, one month into the season and my body caught up with me. I'd in the excitement of having moved somewhere new training with older women who I could sometimes beat in racing for sure, but were much more experienced just at training than me and adding in a lot of new stimulus. I definitely overdid it (laughs) and my body shut down a little and I had to take some time off racing to recover, find the energy. And I didn't end up racing again until the end of the season at our Canadian national championships where my body was finally recovered. I could walk upstairs without my legs burning. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But at that point I was really out of shape. But so that, that winter, because I had committed to skiing full time, I was taking one university course, but I wasn't juggling high school and skiing. It was my main identity. And then it wasn't going well at all. And I wasn't even really racing for a couple months of it. That was really difficult kind of figuring out how to deal with that. But through the whole time, it was, I wasn't regretting my decision to pursue skiing. I wasn't wishing I was, had gone to university instead and just done that full time. I, I knew that that was where I wanted to be and that I'd be able to come back smarter, <laughs> first of all, and then hopefully stronger. But I learned so much from that year, but it definitely was really difficult. 
and I spent a lot of the time a lot of time on the phone with my mom that year uh <laughs> many tears were shed but throughout it all I never wanted to go somewhere else or go back home or I knew that it was definitely the path I wanted to go on to follow along which was really cool it really cemented for me that I was gonna give everything to pursuing trying to represent Canada at the Olympics and have the best uh, performances possible internationally uh, throughout my career and uh, I'm really happy now looking back that I had that terrible year. <laughs> it taught me so much. If it just would have been a breeze, I think there would have been a lot of really important things that I wouldn't have learned that could have hindered me more down the road. And I have to imagine it, it not only having a tough year, how helpful that is for an athlete just to shape up their mentality, but for it to happen at such a young age, I think is helpful as well. Because then it gives you all the time in the world to apply all the lessons you learn the next 10, 15, 20 years in your athletic career compared to somebody where, like you said, you could have had that one one year as a breeze. Um, but even if the next 10 years were a breeze, that could set somebody up, I think, for a lot of trouble. I mean, we all want to have great years, of course. <laughs> but we do want to yeah. have some adversity at the same time so we know how to actually deal with it. And I think that earlier on, we can face the adversity as long as we have the support system around us to support us, uh, which obviously sounded like with your mom and being a part of the Canadian national team that you had an amazing support system around you. It just helps you realize those lessons of, from adversity so much more clear and sets you up obviously for a very successful athletic career after that. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, kids are resilient. <laughs> so I think, uh, a lot of a lot of those struggles would have been a lot harder to to rebound from five years later. So even physiologically, from a physiological standpoint, you know, I had completely buried my body, but I was still pretty young. And a couple months off, I was totally back to a hundred percent and and being able to train and race and build off that again. Whereas you do that to yourself uh, uh, when you're a bit older, sometimes it can take a lot lot longer to recover and all those sorts of things. So yeah, I, looking back, I'm, I'm happy. I had to, to go through that. And obviously you'd always wish it would be all those learning lessons would be condensed into a short period of time and you can gain all the knowledge and not really have that big of a setback, but that isn't really how, how life works. And in the grand scheme of things, I've been extremely lucky. I have definitely dealt with injuries, but I haven't had any injuries that have taken me out an entire season or completely sidelined me. And I've seen many teammates and friends have to deal with multiple years of injury where they're not even able to make it to the start line. And I can't even imagine how difficult that would be. So I feel grateful for, for that and that I've been able to kind of take these lessons I've learned and, but still be able to, uh, be on for the most part on a kind of upward trajectory along the way. Now, is it, is it common for somebody just fresh out of high school to be invited to the Canadian national team for cross country skiing? Like, was it something that you were expecting to happen at, at a younger age for you or what, did it kind of maybe was more of an exceptional circumstance given all the success as, as a junior? So yeah, I was I was training with the junior national team at that point. I was also training with uh, another uh, World Cup uh, development team here in Canmore. So uh, the junior national team was partially supported. So my decision to come to Canmore uh, was my own. I could have gone elsewhere. I wasn't uh, at, at 18. I still kind of had that flexibility, but I wanted to be I wanted to be surrounded by the best and the uh, and that was where um, the best were in Canada. I definitely had thought about do, going the NCAA route and getting getting a scholarship and going to school and racing. And ultimately, it was the it was the teammates I would have in Canmore that drew me drew me to join there. And I did then two years later make the senior national team directly from graduating as a junior and. That uh, that definitely caused me to decide to stay, even though the women's team had uh, gotten a lot smaller at that point, and I was being offered full ride scholarships to a lot of NCAA schools. So it was definitely something that I was I was considering because a free education is uh, very tempting. 
but I did in the end choose to stay within the Canadian Canadian system. I think, I mean, I, I am solely happy with the route I've taken. I think it, there would have also been great opportunities in, in going to school in the States and racing, but uh, I definitely don't, don't regret at all uh, the choices I've made and I'm happy with uh, the opportunities and where it's taken me as an athlete. So I think it may be, there were just definitely other athletes that were, were doing, making the same choices as me. There are a few athletes that graduate directly from junior to senior onto the national team, but not, not everyone for sure. So I definitely had a, a smooth path when it comes to that. <laughs> and when you were talking there about, you know, the, the choice between NCAA and sticking with the, the Canadian team, it made me think about just how, like how tough decisions like that are but also like how important it is to really thoughtfully lay out the pros and cons of each. Cause I think that's such an integral step to then being at peace with whatever decision you're making. And of course, a lot of people I think like to look back, you know, hindsight is 2020 and Oh, I should have made this decision or whatnot. But in the moment, if you're able to very thoughtfully and clearly lay out all the pros, the pros and cons of each. And in that moment, decide that this decision has more pros than this other decision. I think that is such just a powerful exercise for anybody that are going through life-changing decisions um, and just taking that step to being at peace with whatever decision you make, no matter the outcome of it. Because in the moment, as long as you're doing your best to analyze everything, sure, you, you could have potentially, based on how things played out, maybe the other decision was the better choice for some people. But in the moment, I think just being at peace with whatever decision you make using those pros and cons. I mean, I do pros and cons for everything, I guess is what I was trying to get to. Like literally any decision I have to make big or small, I think in my house, in my head, what are the pros? What are the cons? Let me out, let me weigh them both. And then I'm at peace with my decision. That's so true. That's so true. And I, I really was grateful because my parents were supportive of, and my family was supportive of whatever choice, choice I made. So I didn't feel like I had pressure weighing on me from what other people thought I should do. My my family always said there you can always go to school. You know, school is not running away from you. I, I am taking some university courses and working towards a degree, but it's been a very slow process. And but I've I was always uh, super thankful for for their support and the fact that they just wanted me to. You can't ski forever, and so their full support of me be pers- deciding to pursue that as my main focus and knowing that. They, they were never worried that, it, you know, I'm not going to finish my degree. I, I know I'll go back and or continue and finish school when I'm done racing. And knowing that I that uh, other people kind of weren't expecting me to hurry up that process really made it easy for me then to weigh out the, my personal pros and cons and make a decision, decision I was happy with uh, based on all the information I had, which... Uh, I think was a a really a nice thing. And I'm super grateful for that because I saw many, many friends, teammates, people who have stopped skiing since who, you know, felt that strong external pressure. Uh, and it wasn't just a decision for themselves and their sports. So I have extreme gratitude for how my family handled that and let me kind of be in charge of my own decisions without, uh, tr- yeah, trying to sway them. Right. Right. That's, it's, it's such a tricky situation. I think for a lot of people that external pressure, because in, in most circumstances, I won't say all circumstances in most circumstances, you can choose like whether or not you're going to listen to it or not, but you can't necessarily like choose like how long lo- not to hear speaking. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sometimes that external pressure can get really, really amped up and it's almost like you're in a corner and you have nothing, no other choice, but to follow along with, with whatever everyone else is telling you to do. Um, which I guess is just, you know, a segue into, you know, a, a, a sort of guide to people to how to find that support system that works for them is to choose the people that are going to be there for you no matter what decision you make and will be at peace with whatever decision you make. And not necessarily about what they want you to do, but they want you to do what you want to do. Yeah. Yeah. That's very true. And, and just knowing that the people that you're surrounding yourself with and that you choose to support as well 
are striving to be them be- their best selves and are working hard at whatever they're doing. And I think that that importance of, you know, if you're just <laughs> sitting idly doing nothing, uh, there's it's there's often that encouragement to, okay, what do you want to do with your life? Where, where, where do you want to see yourself go? And that's usually very well intentioned, but a lot of the times I, I think it's, it's great when, you know, if you, if you have your, your friends and family and you see that they're striving towards something and uh, trajectories aren't a straight line. So I always try to be super su- supportive of if someone's, you know, making informed decisions they're working hard towards something and they're putting their passion into something. It's, it's, it's their decision and their, their place to, to work hard on that. And I think it's important for me, it's just important to support whatever people are, you know, putting their, their effort into whether it's uh, in line with what I would do or not. Uh, so <laughs> I try to, as much as possible, I am an opinionated person to re- re- refrain from putting my own views onto other people's paths. And I really appreciate that when uh, it's uh, the same way uh, from others. So just that trying to, to foster growth and improvement uh, in whatever it may be. Right. Because uh- I, I've tried to take on the same approach as well. And I try and tell myself when I have an opinion of something, like this might be my opinion of it, but I don't truly like have like can hundred percent replicate what that person is going through and all of the feelings and emotions. I can't see things through their eyes. I can't feel what they're feeling. I have my opinion of what they should do from my perspective, but I can't with 100% certainty or 100% accuracy take their perspective on things. And it's made me really kind of take a step back about, I guess, being so forceful with opinions about whatever it is in the world, small, big, global, in my house, whatever it is, Yeah, that I have my opinion. But at the end of the day, that person has their own perspective and I can't replicate that. And I think there's a, a bit of like, understanding that sometimes the choices that people make or the opinions they have are because of their own personal experiences that I haven't experienced myself. For sure. And it's, it's really easy to, I mean, I feel like everyone thinks their opinions, right? Naturally. And then you hear someone else's opinion and their reasons behind it. And you could realize that you're completely wrong or you could be right. But I've tried really hard in the last few years to, try to make sure I fully listen and understand other people's opinions instead of just passively listening and continuing to think my opinions, right. And really dissect why, why are they saying this and how does it differ from what I'm thinking? And, uh, to think more critically about, about, uh, the information instead of just sticking strong to my original opinion. And I think that's really allowed me to have a better understanding of, teammates, friends, family, just the world as a whole. And there's often been times where I've realized my opinion was completely wrong and changed my opinion. And I think that's something that I probably wouldn't have done five years previously. And so I'm really, uh, yeah, happy that I've been able to start to incorporate that and trying to continue to do that more and more because, I mean, life is about learning and if you, if we were all right all the time, we would never kind of grow and learn. So I tried to start thinking about the times when I, my opinion gets flipped or I realize I was completely off base as, as positives, not negatives. Active listening is really such like a skill. It's like you said, it's there's, there's, there's active and passive listening. And, and, you know, I think naturally people think listening is just like everyone listens because everyone can, most people can hear. And they can hear what you're saying. That means they're listening to you. But like you said, there's a difference between passive listening, just hearing the words, and active listening, like understanding the words, I guess is probably one way to decipher between the two. But it, it really is a skill. Like anything else in life, it's a skill that takes time and practice. And you're not going to get it right 100% of the time. But the more you work on it, the better you are as a listener. And I think it just allows you to have so many more you know, enriched conversations and just helpful conversations with people when we're able to actually active listen to what they say and be able to respond in that context. Yeah. And going back to what we talked about right at the beginning, and I was, I was talking about, you know, not 
punishing yourself for when you don't succeed. I think I've tried to take the same mentality into listening actively in those, those conversations and interactive conversations and opinions is, you know, sometimes I might get it wrong and sometimes I might be stubborn and keep my opinion. And then down the road kind of see that I, I was wrong and not punish myself for that, but then actively kind of make, make a point of trying to, um, mention that, or, you know, apologize and maybe the wrong word, but, uh, bring that to light that, you know, what me being stubborn about something or whatnot was maybe not, uh, I wasn't actually right in trying to like learn and grow from that, um, without feeling like I need to be punished for not doing something perfectly. And so I think, yeah, in as the more everyone is able to do that, the it's, uh, it makes for a more uh, inclusive and uh, growth oriented environment for sure. I think that's, um, a beautiful point to to end this conversation on Daria. I had, you know, I learned a lot myself and I had an absolute blast chatting with you. Um, so thank you so much for your time. And of course, nothing but the best, um, of luck and, 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 you know, well wishes for your health as, as the Olympic training is starting up, I think for yourself. Yeah. Thank you so much, Adam. It was a pleasure speaking with you.